Who here thinks that they can get everyone in the room to line them before the event ends? Okay, for, for you, this, is, this talk is not for you, but for everyone else, it's pretty tough. Yet I bet you know someone who can. Someone that everyone seems to like, he can get him anywhere and make friends. And sometimes it isn't fair. You see, you might be the sweetest, kindest person on the planet, yet he gets the girl. You could be the most talented coder or designer to have ever lived, yet he gets the race. And you ask yourself, why is that? Simply put, the world is white with favoritism. People will choose the person they like, regardless of the actual quality of that person. And you ask yourself, can you be as charismatic as that person without being born with that talent? Is it about cost? Not really. Your answer might be psychology. Namely, a branch of psychology is often frowned upon called manipulation. Who are manipulators? They are people who influence you and get you to like them and do what they want without you noticing. Don't believe me? Let me try and show you how. I want you to do exactly as I do. Do not give me a chance to trick you. Okay, ready? Everyone extend your hands like this. Now what happens? Go like this. Like this. Hold them tight. Make sure your right thumb is over your left thumb. Okay, perfect. Now extend your fingers. Clap them. Okay. So you did exactly as I did, right? If I did not trick you, I want you all to do this. And not only that, not only that, I bet you didn't notice that there's an extra N in illumination on the ticket we gave you. Check it out. So, so it's possible to do stuff behind your back without you noticing. But how would the same concept be linked to getting people to like you? Surely something as complex as the human mind isn't tricked the same way that you were tricked just now. Not even the fanciest psychology professor can do that, right? But here's the thing. The best manipulator out there isn't really a psychology professor. He's a con artist waiting for you in a dark alley. A sales representative waiting to scam you out of your money. These people are experts in using your mind against you. Well, what are you going to do, huh? If only we could be like them. Anyways, thank you. This has been great. Thank you. Whoa, 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 whoa. This isn't a TEDx talk. If I just came here and told you who a manipulator is and left, right? Here are five concepts on how you can be manipulated. Concept number one, getting people to like you. You are now a manipulator, but you don't want the person in front of you to know that you're trying to trick them. We want to portray you as a warm and loving person. So you smile. Not just any smile, there are two types of smile. There's this overly confident smile that makes you look weird, and a small, genuine smile that makes you appear as if you truly care. Then, you double that up with eye contact. A study in the Aberdeen University in Scotland has proved that eye contact can make you appear as more likable and charismatic. So you've got your winning smile doubled up with direct eye contact. Now we want to talk about what interests them the most. Did you know that the tenth most used word in the English language according to Oxford is I? While you is the eighteenth most used word. People like talking about themselves. Who they are, what they love, what they do, all that. So you should talk about that as well. Who are you? Wow, really? You are such an amazing person. Don't overdo it though. This isn't flattery. This is gently stroking a person's ego. On to our next one. Concept number two. Ask questions. Get people to open up. Let me ask you all a question. If you rule the planet, what would your first order be? I want you to find a stranger in the break and discuss your uh, answer with them. Instant conversation.
conversation started. You want someone to talk? Ask them a question. Not just any question, though. Not your everyday questions. How are you? What did you do today? What do you think about the recent event just happened? Not all that. Raise your hand if you've been asked one of those questions today. Okay? Now I'll ask you a question and I want you to raise your hand if someone asks you that. Would you rather sweat mayonnaise or switch genders every time you sneeze? Okay, that is an oddly specific question, but okay, you get the point. And as strange as a question like that might seem, it actually gets people talking. But here's the important part. You should be ready to listen. Stay silent, literally. One of the te techniques used by interviewers to squeeze questions, uh, answers out of you is to stay silent after you've talked. Would you mind introducing yourself? Yes, I'm Karim Azmi, I'm uh, 18 years old. Uh, and um, into psychology, and so on. We feel the need to fill in the awkward silence so we talk even though we might not want to. We also need to be able to steer conversation in the direction we want. Want someone to talk about their love life? Talk about yours. Make it seem that you're pouring your heart out, telling them your innermost secret, even though you might not be. Tell them, you know what, let me tell you a secret, don't tell anyone, even though everyone already knows. That will make them feel that you are worthy of their trust, and they will open up to you. Now, we'll talk about things that are a bit more interesting. Concept number three, drive the person crazy. So now we got the person to like you, but we want them to absolutely love you. But first, you've got to understand the person in front of you. Your best bet is body language. You see, body language can actually help you understand the feelings and the thoughts of the person in front of you. This is a sign of negativity. Don't like what's being said. I don't agree with you that I'm being attacked. I probably cross my arms. It's an evolutionary action, really. Our ancestors would cover their chest where most of the vital organs are located whenever they felt in danger. And we kind of carried the habit over. This is a cry out for attention. We tend to make ourselves seem bigger so we can be noticed more. Usually done by people who feel that they are left out or feel that their opinion is not really getting across. Watch the person's feet. They usually point out where the mind wants to be. If my feet are towards the door, I probably want to leave. If we're in a group and my feet are towards only you, I probably like you. Feet towards everyone else but not you? Not so much. If my feet are spread out to include the whole group, I'm generally enjoying the company. One of the most interesting things is how to spot a liar. Here's a tip. Watch your hands. You see, as children, we subconsciously want to prevent ourselves from lying. So we cover our mouth. I did not break that. However, as we grow older, we control our actions more, but you can't escape the subconscious mind. So you might do something like, nope, didn't break that, and so on. But don't take these as solid proofs. They're more indicators. You have to take them into context. Like a person in the cold isn't crossing your arms because they're negative. But you're not there yet. You're not reading the person inside out. Kind of like how people who give out palm readings do, or people who give out horoscopes and all that. Let me tell you a little secret. These people use a technique called cold reading. Basically, they tell you a statement that is broad enough to apply to almost everyone. Here are a few examples. You have a need for people to like and admire you. You enjoy the company of your friends, but sometimes you feel that you want to be left alone and just push everyone away. You lay at night in bed, thinking of unrealistic aspirations and, and impossible scenarios. Pretty accurate, right? For all of us. And that makes people feel that you, they already, they, like you already know them. So they open up to you more. So now, we want to put the information you gathered to practical use. We we'll use a technique called intermittent reinforcement, coined by the psychologist B.F. Skinner. I'll try to explain what that is. Let me tell you about an experiment called the Skinner Box. It's the most important experiment you will ever hear about. Focus with me on this one. There was a cage and a pigeon. In that cage was a bar. And every time the pigeon pecked the bar, food would drop. There were three variations to that test. Number one 
was when every time the uh, bar was packed, food would drop. And naturally, the pigeon only went to the bar when it was hungry. We'll call this test A. The second time was when the bar did not drop food. And to no surprise, the pigeon stopped going there. We'll call this test B. The third part, and my favorite, is when the bar sometimes dropped food and sometimes didn't. The pigeon didn't know when the food would come and when it would stop, so it went crazy, it kept picking the bar like crazy. This is test C. Let me try and link how that can work to make the person like you. Remember test A? Those are people who are always kind, unbelievably nice people, and we all know someone like that. However, just like the pigeon, we only go to them when we need them. Test B are people who are always rude and avoid people, and naturally we avoid them back. Now test C is people who give out intermittent reinforcement. In other words, people who balance out between too nice and too rude. Those are the bullies, the abusive lovers, people who everyone seems to love yet you don't understand why. Because as horrible as you might think they are, sometimes they give out the reinforcement you really like. To sum it all up, I'm not telling you to be an asshole. But I'm telling you to be an asshole sometimes. Concept number four, getting what you want. Now the person likes you, but you want to get what you want from them. Here's a fun little technique called the unargued technique, which is basically six steps on how to win almost any argument. Step number one, listen. Now you imagine that you work for an advertising company, and your biggest client wants to remove an actor from a commercial and replace it with a son. Your boss told you you cannot let this happen. So the client walks in, we'll call him John, and he begins stating his case. Look, the audience isn't going to trust an actor. My son is much more trustworthy. Most of us would stop at this point and argue against what he just said. But we usually don't say our real reason behind an argument on the first time. So you should say something like, is there anything else? And he might reply, and I've also really wanted him to be on TV. It's all what he ever wanted. So now we know this real reason behind this decision. Step number two, agree with his feeling. You're not going to agree to what he said. However, you will agree what, to what he feels. You're not going to tell him, yeah, sure, let's do the commercial with your son. But you will tell him, you know what? My father also really wants to make me happy. If my son wanted to be on TV, I'll do anything to get him there. So now John feels that you are on his side. Step three. Establishing common standpoints. Now you want to fur further strengthen that notion that John has that you're on the same side. So you point out anything that's common between you. And you know what, John? We both want to make you money. We both want this commercial to succeed. So we need to do this right. Now John feels that this is no longer an argument. This is a problem that you, as a team, are trying to solve. Step number four. Solve the main issues. While doing the first three steps, you should be thinking on how we'd solve the main issues in stated in step number one. This is up to your imagination, but my solution for it would be something like, uh, we'll create a social media ad campaign that will feature your son. So he gets, you know, he gets some glory and all that. Step number five, save shame and compromise. No one wants to feel that they have lost an argument. So you might tell him, you know what? My boss told me that I should charge you extra for a social media ad campaign, but for you, I'll do it for free. Even though that might be what you intended from the beginning. Kind of like how vendors at bargain stores do. You see, this shirt's for 100 pounds, my friend. But for you, I make it 70. So, you have to do something like that. Step six. None of what you just did got John to say yes. However, it stopped him from saying no. So make the decision for him. Tell him, I think we should reach a really good agreement. Let me go get the papers for you to sign them. He doesn't have a reason to tell you not to do that. And you just got what you want. And out of personal experience, this technique works 90% of the time, which is amazing. On to our last uh, point, concept number five, wrapping it all up. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking. I'm not going to be able to do all that. I don't have the confidence. I'm not going to go up to a random stranger and ask him a question. People won't talk back to me. But let me 
to tell you a story. Less than eight years ago, I could not, under any circumstances, talk to anyone. I had zero friends. Uh, then one day, I traveled outside the country, and I was at a pool, and people of my age came in. So I talked. These people don't know I'm awkward. They don't know that I can't make friends. So what if I pretended that I was the most charismatic person on earth? That I was the pop most popular among my friends? I tried it, and let me tell you, I've never been more social in my life, and never more nervous, but I did not show it. I pretended that I wasn't, and they believed me. Here's my advice for you. Fake it till you make it. I'm still faking it. I haven't really made it, but at least I'm here in TEDx, so that's something. And, and this is all the start. You're not the manipulator yet. You still have a long path ahead of you. In fact, let me give you a first assignment. I want you to go home today with at least three new friends. People from here, people you meet on the way home, whatever. I want you to go out there, experiment, have fun, enjoy yourself. 